Libai, seeing Menghauran off from Yellow Crane Tower. From Yellow Crane Tower, my old friend leaves. In the flower mists of April, he heads down to Zhangzhou. Lonely sail, distant silhouette, he disappears into blue emptiness. I see only the long river flowing to the edge of heaven. So we continue with the uh, heptaslavic quatrains, and it comes the time now to see Li Bai's two contributions in this series. Li Bai, as you know, a wonderful poet, probably the best or the second best poet of the Tang Dynasty, and probably the, the best or the second best poet of all classical Chinese literature. And he doesn't disappoint here as well. Now, Li Bai had a it's a prodigiously big production, some of which might be apocryphal. And uh, inside of that big production, some poems uh, have achieved a great deal of fame. I believe this is one of those. I mean, uh, if I had to think of four or five uh, Levi poems that come to mind, this would be one of them. I'm sure I've read it in different versions. I've seen commentaries of this poem so on and so forth. So first, let's start off with the title, Seeing Meng Hao Ran Off from the Yellow Crane Tower. Now, the Yellow Crane Tower, we, we've encountered before. We told uh, in previous videos uh, that it was a, an important uh, landmark in the south of China. It was located in modern-day Wuhan, in the, in the Jiangsu River, and it served uh, as you know a beautiful landmark in what was essentially a hub of trade and commerce between the, the very important southern Yangtze River, the Grand Canal that connected that with uh, the Yellow River and uh, the capitals in the north. And Yellow Crane Tower and meetings at Yellow Crane Tower appear in a lot of high Tang poets. The most famous poem is one that was in this anthology by Tsui Hao, I think, Yellow Crane Tower. I believe there is at least another one, maybe by Du Fu, I'm not 100% sure, but I think there might be. Uh, this is Li Bai's contribution. I think there's another one by another Haitang poet, maybe it's Sun Shen or Wang Changling, one of those. Now, the Yellow Crane Tower references a myth. Uh, the Yellow Crane Tower um, is connected to the story of one of these Taoist uh, transcendents, one of these Taoist immortals, who, after purifying himself and uh, practicing mystical and alchemical arts and, and joining with the Tao, uh, he managed to purify his body so much that he was able to fly to heaven and live as an immortal uh, in the skies, and he flew away in a yellow crane. Now, this story is um, is referenced in the Tsui Hao's poem, this idea that the immortal was here and is no longer here, and I find an echo of it in this poem, as I'll comment when I start with the first couplet. So the, the Yellow Crane Tower here is not just functioning as a historical and geographical um, pointer of, of a place where effectively Li Bai said goodbye to Men Hao Ran. Uh, the, the symbolism that it, in, that it incarnates is also translated to the relationship of Men Hao Ran with Li Bai. So continuing, uh, Li Bai and Men Hao Ran, they had a very close relationship, it seems, if we are to believe uh, the literary histories and uh, the poems. Uh, Meng Haram was older than Li Bai. Uh, they both shared a, a lack of success with officialdom and therefore uh, adopting um, recluse and Taoistically inclined personae. I think uh, it said that this poem was uh, written and this parting between Li Bai and Meng Haram took place just after one of the um, I think it was the second failed attempt by Men Haoran to achieve office when, when he just went to vent out his frustration on a tour of the South. And uh, very important, the poem says he's going to Zhangzhou. Zhangzhou was a sort of New York of, of medieval China. It was a very big entrepot of commerce in the Yellow, sorry, in the, in the Yangtze River, a city of merchants of immense wealth and trade pretty close to the, the, the old southern capital that had been destroyed, and uh, uh, a seductive place, and a place where I imagine Meng Haoran would have found patrons and parties with which to try to forget the frustrations of failing to become a scholar official. 
Now, the topic of the poem, from the title, we can see that topic is parting. And uh, that's pretty straightforward what the poem is about. It's a very intense, a very vivid uh, representation of the sadness of parting between two scholar officials, two friends. And we won't uh, insist on all that we have talked about Chinese poems of parting. They're always sad. Parting is always a metaphor of death, uh, showing whether intensely felt or, 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 or more socially conventional pain at parting from somebody, you know, it's what is to be expected of scholar officials. It's uh, a part of their behavior and of their esprit de corps, you could say. And I think this piece is a very good representative of the genre. So let's take a look at the poem couplet by couplet. So the first couplet actually, as usually in these poems, in, in quatrains, the first couplet generally gives you the background, uh, the, the chronotope, you could say, both the space and the time and the circumstances and the characters that uh, protagonize this short story. It's, it's generally more descriptive and more objective than, than the second part. And the second part focuses, this is not always so, but it tends to be, the second part generally focuses more on the psychological aspects, on the feelings, and there's generally a turn uh, in the third line of the of the quatrain towards a different perspective, which is meant to be illuminating and uh, slightly surprising or shocking in a good sense. So the first couplet. From yellow crane tower, my old friend leaves. In the flower mists of April, he heads down to Zhangzhou. So here we get the story. As I said, pretty, pretty prosaically, pretty directly. A yellow crane tower acts as an axis, as, or as a starting point. It's the the X, the the leaving direction. So in this place, the friend is leaving. So we might imagine that Meng Haoran and Li Bai are at the yellow crane tower. The poem starts. The friend is leaving in the opposite, in an away direction from the yellow tower. In which direction? The second line tells us. He's going down to Zhangzhou. He's going to the south. That's his direction. So from the yellow tower and to Zhangzhou. The poem also gives us a seasonal background. In the flower mists of, of April. So this is pure spring. April would have been in the Chinese calendar the second month of the year and uh, full spring. And again, we would have the connotation of spring. Uh, generally, nature, in, as we've commented in Chinese poems, correlates with, uh, or is meant to correlate in the poems with human feeling. Correlation does not mean uh, e equality. Like, like there might be a correlation that is contrastive, like spring is a time of happiness and flourishing. Here, it's rather a time of parting and sadness. So there is a dissonance instead of a harmony between the season and the feelings, but still there is a connection. Or, or at least there is the convention that the poet expects a harmony between humankind and nature, which in this case is not fulfilled. Second couplet. Lonely sail, distant silhouette, he disappears into blue emptiness. I see only the long river flowing to the edge of heaven. So we mentioned the Yellow Crane Tower at the beginning as, you know, just an accidental place where the two poets meet. But the personas with which both Levi and Menharam played were those of, of in transcendent, immortal sages, Taoistically inclined hermits that were ready to renounce the world and its ambitions and to, to transcend to a higher realm that would be freed from petty thoughts, ambition, and courtly uh, intrigues. Uh, Levi's moniker was a banished immortal, like he was a Taoist god that just um, had accidentally landed on the earth. Men Haorang also cultivates this image of detachment. And the yellow crane tower here is acting, I think, or could be acting as a, as, as a symbol of Men Haorang himself. Just like Men Haorang is leaving the yellow tower, so the Taoist immortal left on a crane, the yellow crane tower, in times mm, long gone. And this, uh, I think this is represented very well in this second couplet. The second couplet doesn't explicitly tell us feelings, but it, the imagery, the disappearing boat, the disappearing sail, the merging of heaven and earth into a blue indistinctness, all this imagery, apart from conveying the sadness of the poet, I think is conveying this Taoist imagery of, like, Meng Haoran floats away and like a Taoist immortal, he disappears 
into a merging of heaven and earth, and, and earth into the great void of transcendence. He is not just going away to the town of Yangzhou. He seems to be floating away into immortality and into the heavens. Now, the images in the third line are, I think, are very well crafted. They're very cinematic, like lonely sail. So there is a jump from the first couplet to the second couplet chronologically. We might imagine that in the first couplet, the two poets were at the tower. Now some time has passed, and we are meant to imagine that Levi has been on the shore, seeing his friend part on a boat to the south for a long time, for many, many hours, looking as the boat goes floating away, floating away. So after some time looking, the only thing that is visible is a lonely sail. The sail would have been a big white sail. So after maybe, I don't know, half an hour, one hour, two hours, the only thing that remains visible of the boat is this lonely sail. Lonely is a very good adjective because not only is it describing the sail, it's probably denoting the feelings of Levi and presumably Menhauran as well. Second, we have distant silhouette. So now further time has passed. Now the sail is not recognizable. Now we just see this vague, distant, dark silhouette floating on the river. And finally, the third one, he disappears into blue emptiness. So finally, we had a lonely sail, then a silhouette, and then nothing. Nothingness, going into nothingness, it is a very Taoist conceit. The idea that, uh, this is also a Buddhist topic, about uh, the, the, the essential value, the essential importance of, um, of dissolving into the Tao, which seems a paradoxical something full with everything, but also a nothingness. So in the end, uh, Menharam has disappeared into blue emptiness. So blue emptiness evidently looks like, uh, like uh, the Taoist heavens. This blue emptiness evokes like the void beyond the stars. Oh, it also evokes very practically, like, like Li Bai is looking at the river, which is blue. But it's a spring day, probably without many clouds. The skies are blue. So and maybe it's getting dark. Maybe the sun is setting. So the heaven, the blueness of heavens and earth seems to mix into some sort of mass, especially when you look at the horizon. And... Uh, but again, blue emptiness, you know, really seems to bring to mind these Taoistic heavens or places where the, where the Tao, the original force, coalesces to then divide into the myriad things. But the essence, Menhauran has disappeared. What can Levi see in the last line in the last image? I see only the long river flowing to the edge of heaven. Menhauran's physicality has disappeared. He has like a snake transcended the poem and transcended the self, left behind the skin of his memory. He is like a Taoist sage who has flown away, only the remains in the world below remain. This long river, long river was another name for the Jiangzi, flowing to the edge of heaven. It goes forward and forward, apparently mixing with heaven and forming this vast mass, this vast blue emptiness that just keeps going on and on, forming like a, a heavenly background where the, the, the sagely Menhauran can disappear. So, overall, pretty nice poem, pretty satisfactory one. I think one of Levi's well-deserved uh, famous pieces.